So you made a post the other day about a little trip you made down to Myrtle Beach. Essentially, as soon as you got down there, things started to go bad. I'd really like to hear this uh, story in, in some more detail. So we set up this Amazon business on autopilot and we hired this one person. We spent six months teaching how to do everything. We had this one manufacturer that was doing great. And we had some other manufacturers. And we said, you know what? We don't care about the other manufacturers. Let's just focus on this one and maximize this. We stopped selling the other manufacturers. We have one person running everything. We have one manufacturer fulfilling all our orders and money is just coming in. We figured it out. We are entrepreneurs. Let's go on vacation. And on the first day of vacation, the manager quits on me. I get a phone call from him. I get a phone call from the manufacturer telling me they're dropping me. And then I get a third call from my accountant telling me that someone filed a fake tax return in my name, stolen my identity, and I was going to have to deal with that mess when I got back. So... Welcome to the Brad Dog Media Show with your host, What's going on guys? Brady Hester here, host of the Brad Dog Media Show. Today we welcome Nathan Hirsch to the podcast. Nathan co-founded FreeUp, which sold for a pretty hefty price by my estimation. I didn't get the exact number from him. I tried on the podcast, but he didn't give it to me. Um, but it was an eight figure business, very successful. And he has since moved on to Outsource School which shows you how to find and work with, you know, whether it be a virtual assistant or other people that you need to outsource with to help scale your business. And with over 10 years of entrepreneurship experience, it was great to learn from him. He had some pretty funny stories about uh, being a successful entrepreneur in college, which had its interesting situations. And um, it was a fun interview and I'm excited for everybody to hear it. If you're enjoying the podcast, please tap that like button and subscribe for me. I really appreciate that. And enough from me. Welcome to the show. Nathan Hirsch, welcome to the Brad Dog Media Show. Brad, thanks for having me, man. It should be fun. Yeah, man. Um, man, you have a super cool story. I'm really interested to dive into it here and, and learn about you know, how you got the idea of, you know, developing free up and then, you know, the sale there and all of your transitions and pivots since then. Um, man, we could start from so many different places, but, you know, what got you into entrepreneurship in, in the first place? Where did that kind of start? It's funny. My parents always made me have like real, real jobs, real internships, but I was working 40, 50 hours a week during summer vacations, winter vacations. And I just learned a lot about business in general. I was selling, I was learning how to manage people. And I was lucky enough to work under some business owners that, that kind of taught me as much as I was just working. And I, I learned a lot, but, but I also learned how much I just hated having a boss. I hated watching the <laughs> clock. I hated having a schedule. And so um, when I got to college, I kind of had a glimpse of what life was like after college with a job and I wanted no part of it. So that's what really motivated me to, to start a textbook business, which was my first entrepreneurial endeavor. Like many, you're not interested in uh, working for somebody else. Um, but then, you know, but most don't go, you know, to the level that you do and decide, okay, I'm going to start an actual company for myself. You know, a lot of times it starts, you know, on the solopreneur side hustle kind of level. Where did the idea for free up start in the first place? And, you know, how did that start to form? Yeah, I mean, I, I did start like that. I mean, all my business have started like that. I don't just wake up one day and, and hire 35 people and <laughs> have this huge operation. Uh, I mean, I started off buying and selling textbooks and that was a uh, fine for side money, but I didn't think that was very scalable. I didn't have places to put the textbooks. And that business quickly ended when I got a cease and desist letter uh, from my college telling me to stop competing with them. So really? I, I didn't want to get, yeah, really, I, I didn't want to get kicked out of school. So I pivoted and I'd sold some of these books on Amazon. So I just started experimenting and doing a lot of trial and error. And I spent six months to a year just trying every single product that I could on Amazon until finally coming across baby products. For whatever reason, baby products had the good margin. They were easy to ship. I could work with manufacturers. Um, I was drop shipping them. And this business started to scale. Amazon was taking off, which meant my business was taking off. And I had to start hiring people. 
and I hired college kids, which was a, an absolute disaster. And I tried hiring like US adults and wasted a lot of money doing that. They didn't really take me seriously. So I really got into the VA space out of necessity uh, because I just needed help and, and I couldn't find reliable help. And so I hired my first VA who was a rock star, hired a VA after that who wasn't very good. And But I, I kind of realized the potential of, hey, if I could figure this, this VA hiring thing out, my, I finally get the help that I need. It becomes scalable. It becomes lean. I can hire people, flexible schedule, whatever hours I need. And, and so I then set out on a mission to learn how to hire, just like other people learn how to market or learn how to do finance. And when I finally figured it out, I ended up coming up with the idea to build my own marketplace because I just got sick of the Upworks and Fivers. It just took too long to find talent. And so I launched free up just going after Amazon sellers because I was an Amazon seller. And I said, Hey, I've got these VAs. I'm vetting them already. You let me know what you need. I'll introduce you quickly. Um, and from there, I, the free up started to grow and we ventured outside Amazon and we ended up building free up to an eight figure business completely run by virtual assistants, no office, no U S employees. Our internal team was all remote in the Philippines, uh, before being acquired by, by one of our clients. Yeah, that's amazing. It's so interesting how that works sometimes where, you know, you're just in a space on your own and you come across an issue and you're like, okay, if this is a problem for me, it's a problem for other people. Now, how can I solve it? And then next thing you know, that ends up being the business, you know, which didn't seem to be your goal in the first place, really, was it? No, I mean, we build our businesses to be sellable. Um, but we don't, we weren't planning on selling free up. I mean, I still like free up. I like free up last year. I didn't go into last year saying, Oh, we need to sell this thing. Like I still talk to my team from over there and it was hard, like not being able to work with our team anymore, but I, it, the, it all kind of came together. Like the, uh, one of our clients reached out to us and said, Hey, we're interested in getting into the VA freelancer space. We bought other companies before we don't want to start it from scratch. And they ended up making us an offer. And from there, we started doing due diligence on them. We didn't want to sell it to someone who was going to drive into the ground or hurt our reputation. And they did due diligence on us. And from there, once it checked out and they're great entrepreneurs, I look up to, we still have a great relationship with them today. Um, then it became, how do we make this a win for everyone? So we took $500,000 from our sale. We gave it to our internal team in the Philippines, made sure they were taken care of. And we really looked at it as a, a win for us, a win for the team, a win for the new business owners. And it's tough to turn down something that, that's a win for everyone. <laughs> yeah. And so for the people listening that might not know, uh, give us the number. How much did it sell for? I can't share that. We actually signed a non-disclosure to, to not share that number. Really? I thought I'd heard it before. Not for me. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Okay. Still super impressive. Really cool. Um, and this is, you know, a good transition into some of the other things I wanted to discuss here. Um, you know, when you're up for a potential sale like that, how important is it to make sure that, you know, everybody that was involved in free up or, you know, whatever company is about to be sold is, you know, actually going to be taken care of. And, you know, you're not just in it to get your payday and, and move on. Yeah. I mean, to us, and we told the new owners this, like if any of our team got screwed over or whatever you want to call it, like we're just not interested in the deal and, and everything was off the table. So, I mean, I mentioned the money we gave them, but it was also that their jobs are secure and that their bonus right. and their raise programs were in place and, and all the stuff that, that went along with it. And so, I, I mean, that was very important to us. I, the, the same people that we hired in the first month of free up were with free up in year four when we sold it. And they're still with that free up almost a year later after we sold it. And I was actually talking to them today. We have a, a Facebook group. So, I mean, we care about these people. We couldn't have done it without them. They were as much a part of free up as anyone else was. And so we, we really wanted to make sure they were taken care of. And I mean, it, it, it kind of like the pandemic happened, which we obviously didn't know when we were going through. And I mean, if you think that things are hard in the U S during a pandemic, imagine what it's like in the Philippines in a third world country. So I think having that security, um, having that, that money and, and the job security and all of that went a long way. I think at the time everyone was sad and, and obviously not being able to work with them was the hardest part, but big picture, we, we feel like it was in the best interest for everyone. Yeah, definitely, man. And I don't know how much you're involved in, uh, I mean, you communicate with them regularly, but I would imagine in 2020, they are continuing to grow with the current state of things. I mean, how important are VAs now, especially this year? 
I mean, I think they're incredibly important. I think free up and other marketplaces are, are in a great spot. Um, I, I, I mean, it's why I started my new venture outsource school, right? So I don't provide VAs or freelancers anymore. But I mean, we live in a day and age where if you're not utilizing VAs and freelancers, you're you're missing out. Your competitors are. They have a huge competitive advantage over you. And even outsource school now, we sell a yearly membership where you get access to all our processes, our, our software, not just hiring processes, but actual SOPs and playbooks. Um, and, and our community and support. I mean, we are growing this business with virtual assistants. Our entire team, again, is virtual assistants. They they go so far as doing client onboarding calls, support calls. Um, they do Facebook Live coaching calls in our group, and they do lower level stuff as well, lead generation and all the stuff that, that we practice and we preach. So, I mean, we believe that, that VAs are, are not only the way of the future, but the way of right now. Everyone's hiring remote. That The people that know how to hire well and have good systems and processes, they're the ones who are able to grow their business. And I always wish that there was someone back in the day that could, that went to me and said, Hey, here's the right system. This is how you hire people. Here are the interview questions you ask. Here's what to avoid doing or else your VA is going to quit on you. That would have saved me hundreds of thousand dollars, hundreds of hours of, of time. And that's really what I've tried to build um, for other entrepreneurs out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. And so uh, just to let people know, like the differences, you know, they might hear uh, free up and then now, okay, well, what's the difference here with outsource school? Outsource school is really more about training people on the process of hiring and working with VAs, right? And, and is it just VAs or, you know, outsourcing in general? Yeah, I mean, it's outsourcing in general. Like my expertise is really hiring VAs from the Philippines. That's what I'm going to teach people to do very well. But we've got plenty of people that take our processes and apply them to their US staff or apply them to hiring from India. Like it, it all applies. There, there are certain parts, like we have a hiring from the Philippines uh, 101 video, but that obviously doesn't apply to hiring people from other places. But outside of that, the, the same process can be applied and there might be a few tweaks and stuff like that. And we even go into freelance a little bit. We have a graphic design playbook, a video editor playbook book. And I mean, you can go to free up and get a great VA. I hire my VAs from free up, but I mean, we're, we're not talking about just hiring a VA. We want to teach people how to scale businesses with VAs and, and high level systems and structures and using our advanced tactics that are going to allow you to let the possibilities be endless on how grow, how big you can grow a business completely run by virtual assistants. Yeah. It, it's amazing, man. I mean, I know of people like, especially those who sell on Amazon and, uh, have the ability ability to outsource so much, you know, I mean, I was just talking, I don't know if you know, who RJ hustles is RJ Martinez uh, the other day on the yeah, podcast. Geez, he has a whole team of a handful of people running, you know, so much for him. And it's crazy how much you can scale with not actually having full-time employees. And I think, uh, you know, people underestimate the ability and, and scalability. You don't really have to hire full-time employees to grow. No, I mean, you you really don't. <laughs> we just live in, in a crazy time. And again, you don't need to hire people full-time. Like when I started free up, when I started outdoor school, I hired a VA for five to 10 hours a week. And then I increased them to full time. And then I hired another person. So you kind of have the flexibility. And, and we have people that are solo entrepreneurs that take our stuff and hire their first VA. We have people who already have teams and the entrepreneur, we have people who own multiple businesses. They already have teams and they take their project manager and they have their project manager go through outsource school. And then their project manager hires the VAs. We have people who are, so they're, they're entrepreneurs. They have one business and they already have a team of VAs. And then they take our process and make Make their team better and implement our meeting templates and our bonus and raise programs and all of that. So no matter where you are, there's there's things you can take to improve your business. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, man. So I'd really like to get into how someone kind of goes about this in the first place. Let's say somebody works, you know, just using my industry for example, works in marketing. Uh, say you know they manage people's social media accounts and they need to hire a VA. What are kind of the first steps you'd recommend somebody take? And, you know, as far as searching them out and actually vetting them and seeing if they're the right fit? Yeah. So I like to break down hiring into interviewing, onboarding, training, and managing. And we probably won't be able to cover all four in this podcast, but there's some steps you need to take before you even interview. And step one is understanding the different levels of hiring. And there's three different levels. You've got followers, doers, and experts. So followers, five to 10 bucks an hour, they're there to follow your system, your process. When I say virtual assistant, I'm talking about the followers. Then you've got the doers, the graphic designers, the video editors, the writers, 
you're not teaching a graphic designer how to be a graphic designer, but they're not consulting with you either. They're there to do that one task at a high level. And then you got the experts, the high level freelancers, consultants. They bring their own system, their own process, their own strategy to the table. And you're going to need to hire all three levels at some point, usually starting with the followers is a great place to start. But knowing the different levels is important because a lot of people go wrong and they'll hire a follower when they need a doer or a, a follower when they need an expert, whatever it is. From there, you need to figure out what your budget is. If you go to outsourceschool.com slash VA calculator, we have a cool tool. You plug in information in your business and it shows you how many virtual assistants you can afford. You can also do the math yourself, um, but you need to know how many, v, like how many VAs you can afford and how many hours a week you can afford. You don't want to hire someone, train them, and then realize you can't afford them. And then from there, it's creating a list of all the things you know how to do versus all the things you don't know how to do, but you need to do for your business. And the stuff you don't know how to do, that's where you're going to hire the doers and the experts for. The stuff you know how to do, you're going to organize it by, from easiest to hardest, and you're going to start with the easiest task. And my goal for any new person hiring a VA is to figure out how do you get five hours a week back? What are the easiest tasks that you know how to do? Ideally, it's a task that if someone just completely messes up, your business is fine. It's not the end of the world. Um, and figure out how to get five hours a week back. And from there, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to be able to increase their hours. You're going to trust VAs a little bit more. And from there, you can start taking more and more tasks off your plate. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Um, in my experiences, I've, I've gone some of the uh, <laughs> more complicated ways about going out and vetting and you know, finding people to work with and outsource. So it's it's nice that you have, you know, a step by step approach. I think that really would help people out for sure. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. from there, it, it kind of dives into the interviewing, the onboarding, and the training. I mean, a uh, high level overview for interviewing is, is we focus on people that don't just have experience, but have the attitude and the communication skills. And that's what you really look for in a good virtual assistant is the attitude, um, communication, and experience. And how do you interview them in a 20 to 30 minute period. So you're not doing it for 40 minutes. And we also kind of avoid zoom calls, Skype calls. Uh, we keep everything on Slack, everything in writing, uh, for, for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So I'm curious, it looks like you're just all over the place. I see you on, you know, practically every social media platform that I'm on. What does your day to day currently look like without source school and well, just in life in general, really? Yeah. So <laughs> great question. It's funny. My life's a lot more chill now that I sold free up after really? school is okay. a much more chill business model. Uh, I really mapped out my ideal day. I did this last year, but more so even this year where from seven to 9 AM is when I'm most productive for whatever reason, that's just me. So from seven to 9 AM, I do whatever my most important thing of the day is. So even if I stop my day at 9 AM, most important thing is done. Um, and I usually walk the dog slightly before that. From 9 to 10, I do an intense workout every day. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of working out. Um, and so that's what I'm doing then. And then right after that, I usually do one podcast a day. Um, this one's a little later, but you're my one podcast today. Usually I try to keep my podcast between like 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Um, so I do one podcast in there. And then the, from that noon to 2 o'clock, 2.33 when I end my day is usually phone calls or meetings where I don't actually have to be at my computer. I can be actually outside or walking the dogs or whatever it is. And that's usually my typical day. And then after that, it's, I mean, we're in a pandemic, so there's only so much that you're doing, <laughs> right. um, but hang out with my fiance, friends, family, whatever it is. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a good sounding day. And uh, so free up was a little more stressful and hectic at times. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, free up, you just have like thousands of people, right? You've got your internal team, then you've got all the freelancers on the platform, then you've got all the clients on the platform, then you have all your partners and affiliates. So just a lot of people coming in all directions. And I had an awesome team. They built me 2000 hours a week. Like they did a lot of that, but it's just, it's nonstop. It's 24 seven. It's all the time. Um, outsource school is a much chiller business model. I mean, we have a very active Facebook group where all our members go and they post questions. But if I don't respond to someone's question in like an hour, they're, they're not freaking out. They're, they're reasonable. It's a much more chill uh, community. Yeah, that's nice to hear. Where are you located at? Uh, I'm in Orlando. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, I thought you were Florida. I'm in Kansas City. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you look on the news, uh, which I try to avoid for the most part, right? But it seems like Florida is pretty opened up. Is that not really the case where you're at? 
Um, yes and no. I mean, certain things are certain, but like, they just opened up everything. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to like go out and go back to a normal life. I'm actually in the process of, of moving to uh, Colorado. So that's kind of happening wow. in the next 30 days anyway. So I'm not doing too much besides just packing and figuring out everything that goes into uh, buying a house. <laughs> so, but yeah, Florida at this moment is now open, I believe. Man, wh- why the move? Um, I really like Colorado. My business yeah. partner has lived there for a few years. I go out there once a quarter anyway. And I don't know, just ready for a change. I, I grew up in Massachusetts. I've been in Florida for six or seven years. I mean, we'll keep this place here and um, maybe go back and forth a little bit. But I mean, can't beat Colorado. You got mountains, you got lots of outdoors, you got snow, which we don't have in Florida. So I don't know. I'm excited for just a new adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Colorado is awesome, man. You'll definitely uh, have a little more snow up there. For sure. <laughs> um and you mentioned your business partner um i believe he was with somebody who helped out with free up too right and now you've transitioned with him to outsource school yeah he's been my business partner for 10 years we started he was actually my first employee that i hired on my amazon business he was one of the only college kids that that worked out and then i Put, turn him into a, bit, a partner of my Amazon business. He was a partner with me at FreeUp um, and now with Outsource School. And, and it's actually, there, there's two funny stories with him. One, on the first day that, that I hired him, he called me an hour before a shift and said, by the way, I don't have a car. Can you come pick me up? <laughs> and I was like, who is this guy? I'm not, I'm not picking you up every single day. I lived in a frat house off campus. He was on campus. And those car rides, for whatever reason I did, and those car rides ended up being the best because we would just talk business back and forth and get to know each other and strategize and, and all of that. And the other funny story is when, when we were running this Amazon business and we kind of we got to we got it to over five million dollars a year. Amazon got more competitive. We were kind of stuck in that one to three range. We were making money, but we weren't really growing a brand that we didn't really see it as a long term thing. And we started free up on the side and Connor actually started two other businesses on the side and he was just doing part time in three of them. And I was just focused on free up. And so free up was doing pretty well. It wasn't eight figures like when we sold it, but it was, I was seeing some potential with it. And he asked to meet up on a coffee shop. And I honestly thought he was quitting. I thought he was like, Hey, my other ventures like doing well, I'm going to go focus on that. And it was the exact opposite of that. Uh, he was like, Hey, like I love free up. I see the potential. Like I want to go all in. And it was the easiest decision I ever made making him a full-time partner of free up. And we, we eventually grew it and sold it. So, um, yeah, we, we've gone through a lot together. That's awesome. Do you think you'd have been able to scale and grow, you know, in the same kind of way without having a business partner? Um, not just a business partner without him. No. I mean, we're just totally opposite people. Like, uh, he, he's much more technical on the back end. He works a lot better with our developers. Um, uh, like we have a software simply SOP that, that comes with an outsource school membership that he's been a big part of building free up is a marketplace, but the marketplace is held up by a software and the technical side of it and the marketing side of it. So I end up being the, the face and, and I'm good at certain systems and customer service and support and onboarding and all that kind of stuff. Um, but he's fantastic on the technical end and we just work very like efficiently together at certain points. We've had a third partner and not nothing against the third partners. Like I, I still have a great relationship with them, but we've found that three people is just too much. It just to run to everything by three people just becomes impossible. And Connor and I just get on the same page quickly. And we're also great at just brainstorming stuff. Like over the weekend, I'll just start writing stuff down whenever I have an idea and I'll quickly run by run ideas by him. And we'll be like, all right, eight of those are stupid. Two of those are great. We'll go do them. And, and we just get on the same page quickly and, and we execute very quickly. So, yeah, I mean, having a business partner is tough. You're putting a lot of faith into someone. It can backfire. You never really know what someone's going to be like until you have some bad months, just like if you have some good months. And I mean, I, I feel like I'm very fortunate that I have someone that, that I've trusted for so long. I'd given my social security number, my bank information, like that's how much we trust each other. Plus we have the same values, the same beliefs. We want the same thing. We have the same goals. We believe in treating people well and feedback. And we have the same goals when it comes to scaling businesses and what we want out of a business but completely opposite skill sets, which is what you want in a business partner. That's awesome, man. Um, Speaking of him, I believe he was involved in this trip with you. So you made a post the other day about a little trip you made down to Myrtle Beach. Yeah. And uh, so things were looking pretty great when you left for the trip, right? And then essentially as soon as you got down there, things started to go bad. And I really like to hear this uh, story in, in some more detail. 
Yeah. So we set up this Amazon business on autopilot and we hired this one person. We spent six months teaching how to do everything. So we just didn't have to do any day-to-day operations. And we had this one manufacturer that was doing great. And we had some other manufacturers and we said, you know what? We don't care about the other manufacturers. Let's just focus on this one and maximize it. So we stopped selling the other manufacturers. We have one person running everything. We have one manufacturer fulfilling all our orders. And money is just coming in. We are, we are like, we figured it out. We are entrepreneurs. Like, let's go on vacation. And we go on this trip to Myrtle Beach. And on the first day of vacation, the manager quits on me. I get a phone call from him. I get a phone call from the manufacturer telling me they're dropping me. And then I get a third call from my accountant telling me that someone filed a fake tax return in my name, stolen my identity, and I was going to have to deal with that mess when I got back. So I went from like... I'm on top of the world. No one can touch me. I'm this 20 year old, like entrepreneur guru to let's start this thing all over again um, and build this business up from scratch. And and it was a really hard lesson in diversification. Super happy. I I learned that lesson in year one and um, not year, um, not year five. Um, But we, we built it back up and six months later, the the Amazon business was more diverse and, and bigger than it was before. And I mean, we remember that lesson when we're building teams. We remember that lesson when we're doing fulfillment partners, every, Everything we do now, we we try to diversify. Yeah, that's amazing. How hard was it? I mean, not to just throw in the towel. You know, was that even something that crossed your mind, or how did you kind of fight through that uh, extremely discouraging moment? Yeah, I mean, I was fortunate enough where when that happened, I was either a sophomore or junior, or a sophomore going on to junior year. Um, so I still had time, right? Like I wasn't in the real world yet. I didn't really have like big bills or responsibilities or family or anything like that. Um, So, I mean, at that point it was like, Hey, let's go all out because the alternative is, yeah, I can go get a real job. Like I got a college degree. I never used that. That's hanging up on the wall. (laughs) Um, Like I had a backup plan, but I really didn't want to go do that. And so it was, it was, what did we learn? What resources did we have? Do we have left? What are our options? How do we pick that option and execute it? And then once we've executed it, what steps do we put in place so that never happens again? And, and that's really the process that, that we went through. Yeah, geez, I'd say what a huge learning lesson. That's insane. I mean, and but back to your point, luckily, you know, that happened in the early stages and not, you know, five, 10 years down the road when you have more responsibilities in life. Um, man, but still had to be a, a tough trip back from Myrtle beach. Like, okay, we have, we have some work to do (laughs) for sure. Another thing I'd, you know, really like to discuss, you know, kind of going back to, uh, you know, a business partner, if somebody's wanting to get into entrepreneurship, but they don't really, you know, want to go about it alone and they don't have anybody in mind, you know, currently when it comes to, you know, a potential business partner, how do you go about seeking one out? Or is that even something you should do at first? And, you know, should that come naturally at some point? So getting a business partner because you don't want to go about it alone, in my opinion, is a terrible reason to, to get a business right. partner. <laughs> um, and, and getting a business partner is risky. And just going into business, like, first of all, I don't think I'm the best person to like give business partner advice. I did get lucky. Like he was a kid in my business law class who needed a job, who responded to a Facebook post. I hired him. And then I made him my business partner years later after I built up trust. And that's the way that I would go about it. I mean, I would hire someone or work with someone before you just say, Hey, here's 50% of my company or 20% or whatever that number is like work with them. Make sure you build trust, make sure that they have the same values. Cause I've been in situations and I've heard of other people too, where you find two really talented people but they want to run the business differently. They want a different business model. One person wants to run it for cash. Other people want to run it for whatever other reason. They just have different goals or they're just too similar. And I know Connor's been through this with other partners that he's had is they're just exactly the same. And, and then you just end up working on the same stuff again. You you need to you need someone who likes doing what you hate, good at what you're not good at and vice versa. And you don't really know that until you go through it with someone. And it's also super easy to work with someone where everything, when everything's going well, right? Like if your business is growing every month, it's like, yeah, it's easy to have a partner. You celebrate, you get it, you're winning all the time. But what happens when you have a bad month or you lose a big client or, or so, there's a setback like Myrtle Beach? Like how do you guys work together then? That's what really matters. Because if you can go through the hard stuff, um, then you know you can go through the good stuff as well. So I would take it a little bit more as a slow process and more of a strategic process than, oh, I'm lonely I, I'm, or I don't want to do the work myself, <laughs> but like, let's get a business partner. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting, man. There's so many sites out there right now where it's like it's like Tinder, but for business partners. And it's like, really, you're just gonna make that decision on a swipe? Yeah. And uh, it's tough, man. How, how risky is that? That's insane. <laughs> Yeah. Like I, I, I wouldn't go through like that. Like I, I would definitely, if anything, like give someone equity that you've worked with before, find a way, do some kind of test run, pay a consultant and then make them a business partner. Like there's so many ways to get your foot in the door with a smaller round of risk without risking everything. Yeah, I totally agree. Do you have any funny stories of uh, the random college kids you hired? <laughs> Oh man, I do have a lot of stories. I don't know which ones are, are podcast appropriate. I mean, we've had like the the funniest ones is we had some people who just couldn't like wake up. They just struggled to wake up in the morning. Like like typical college guys, we had this guy who we would have to knock on his door, like pound on his door to get him to wake up for a shift. And we would even when we got into his room, we still had to like drag him out of bed to get him to wake up. We ended up buying him an alarm clock that sounded like a rocket was just like going off in his room, like a gigantic explosion to, uh, to get him off. I mean, we also had tons of like frat parties and stuff where we hired some people in our frat and we'd go and like celebrate afterwards. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like, it's been so long. Like good stories. I mean, it was your typical like college experience. Like I had a great time at college. I, I met a lot of good people, um, people I'm still friends with. Like imagine learning business, running a business while being a fraternity at the same time and, and like all the crazy stuff that, that goes along with it. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Was it weird having like a significant amount more money than everybody else at college? Yeah, I think it it was something that like I tried to just kind of hide and, and not talk about, I guess. Yeah. Um, but definitely, definitely weird. Um, yeah, the, it, it's the weird part wasn't necessarily the money. The weird part is no one knew at the time like what Amazon was. Like if I said I'm an Amazon seller, people didn't know what that is. People thought I was running a scam. People didn't know why I was like selling baby products. Like no one understood what I did or why I was doing it or or how I was making money. So I think part of it people didn't really know I was making money, and then part of it was people didn't really understand what I did, was doing, and people thought I was weird because I was had baby products on my computer all day, and they thought I was running a scam. So I think that was even the weirder part of it oh that's so funny yeah I, I can imagine man people walk in and you just have like baby stuff everywhere like what is going on nathan <laughs> I just remember that there was this person like sitting behind me in class and I was like listing baby products or whatever. And the person like I turned around and they just gave me the most evil, like you're a weirdo <laughs> look and just like never talked to me again after that. Like that was uh, the norm. Man. Yeah. I'd imagine you, uh, you know, did your best to kind of hide the fact you had some cash. Otherwise you'd be picking up every tab. I mean, that would be terrible. Yeah. I mean, I tried to treat, you got to remember, like we hired our friends for years, which was a huge mistake, but it was fun like for, <laughs> for a while when you're not running like a completely serious business. So we would treat people well, we'd buy the beers, we'd like do like that, like not crazy expenses, but um, stuff like that just to, to reward people. So, I mean, there was one part where people would come over and work at our frat house and we would just stock up the fridge with like food and drinks and stuff like that. So we, we did have a, a little fun along the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, what school did you go to? Uh, Quinnipiac University. It's in Connecticut. Oh, cool. Okay. Dang, so that was a long trip down to Myrtle Beach. Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And what did you end up getting your degree in? Uh, small business, actually. Uh, that oh, cool. was a, a new degree in there. I actually remember, so I wanted to go to school for entrepreneurship anyway, but I went in undecided just because, I mean, at 19, what do you really know about what you want to do? And I remember all the teachers, um, all like the, the deans of each department went on stage, all the freshmen were in the auditorium and they said, why you should do finance, why you should do economics. And, and the entrepreneur professor, it was a brand new program, went on stage and just said, if you ever want life freedom, if you ever want financial freedom, the only way to do it is to be an entrepreneur. And then just walked off stage. That was her entire presentation. Wow. And that, that just like stood in my head and drop. yeah, dropped the mic. And, and from there, I, I majored in entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's awesome. So, you know, to be honest, or if you could be honest, I mean, did you actually pick up any skills that apply to today? I would hope. Good question. So it's funny. I feel like the entrepreneur stuff 
like I got a high level view of like managing people and like what it took to run a business and, and the different parts of operations and, and what like Six Sigma was and, and stuff like that. But e-commerce was very new. So I didn't learn anything about e-commerce that could apply to Amazon. But when you're taking entrepreneurship, you're kind of taking a lot of other classes too. So like the accounting skills were very valuable. Like me knowing what a balance sheet and income statement was, like that was very helpful when I was 20 and, and making money and, and stuff like that. So I think it, it gave me a high, oh, like a high level view that was super helpful and made sure I didn't get too far off track. But I think that there were like the, the whole e-commerce and marketing, like that stuff didn't apply. All the stuff that you learned was, was very outdated. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be the case, man. I mean, it was so interesting in uh, my experience with college. I remember I had already had several social media clients. And then this one semester, I walk into a social media marketing course. And I can't say I learned a single thing from that class at that point. You know, I'm like, okay, oh, yeah, okay. Here's how you make a post. Here's what a hashtag is. It was just so funny, man. Yeah, I took a few marketing courses that are like that. I feel like marketing is just a tough thing to to teach in college. Like you really need people that really know how to market that I don't know. That's why the the courses and stuff out there are probably way better than than any college education when it comes to marketing. Yeah, man, it's so hard to keep up. I mean, if you have a, you know, a textbook that's 3 years old, it's too late. Completely agree. It's crazy. Awesome. This has been, uh, you know, super informative. Uh, I'm glad to, you know, learn some more about your backstory here. Um, what do you do in 2020 as far as, uh, you know, having fun goes? Are you uh, doing anything exciting these days or just bunkering in? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I bought a house, so I'm moving. Uh, and yeah, I mean, what's everyone else doing? I'm following <laughs> the news. I'm, I'm, I'm actually playing softball. Softball leagues opened up. I work out a lot. I see people when I, when I can. I do a lot of Zoom calls. I check in on my parents who are a little bit older. And yeah, I mean, I had a lot of travel plans this year that, that got canceled. But I mean, who am I to complain? Overall, I'm super fortunate. I'm, I'm excited for a new chapter in my life. Um, I, one thing I will say that's awesome is my fiance, who didn't work from home, now works from home, which is a lot more fun um, than before. So yeah, I'm kind of with everyone else, just kind of following um, <laughs> following whatever's happening and hoping for the best. Yeah. Yeah. With you there. Awesome. So what can people uh, look forward to from you and where can they follow you at? Yeah, I put out a lot of content. Follow me, Nathan Hirsch on Facebook or LinkedIn, Real Nate Hirsch on Instagram or Twitter. Go to OutsourceSchool.com. You can grab a free trial. Uh, we actually have a coupon code if you want to join Outsource School. Brad Dog Media saves you 15%. And uh, yeah, would love to, to help anyone that I can. You heard him. Brad Dog Media, 15%. Go check it out. Get some savings. Nathan Hirsch, thanks so much for coming on, man. It's been great. Yeah, thanks for having me.